So thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity here to uh, present some of our work and also present, uh, I guess, the uh, model system uh, that we are using here in the lab. Um, so I'm based at the Center of Developmental Neurobiology, also a Center for Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Um, and so we are using uh, different model systems uh, in order to maybe look at genes and their functions. And so uh, today I thought I'm giving you somehow an overview of uh, uh, the system itself and then some of the data that we have been uh, creating with, with the system itself. So just very basic and I know uh, probably a lot of people uh, are aware of this. This is a small uh, freshwater fish uh, originally from Southeast Asia. Um, has been used before, but then actually until the early 80s, not really introduced as a, as a genetic model until the, the experiments from uh, Streisinger. Um, I think a next milestone was uh, really the, the first uh, big large-scale uh, genetic screens by Nussmann, Folhart and Wolfgang Drever uh, that really set the pace for a lot of labs uh, to look at uh, the different uh, mutants and phenotypes and then going for the genes that are responsible for that. And, and I think the third one I wanted to mention is that since uh, 2013, we have the whole genome sequence. This was uh, published by the Wellcome Trust uh, Sanger Institute. And, and so obviously a very important step forward in looking at uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, genes and their function. Now, in terms of the development, they're very fast developing. So one of these advantages, so uh, from fertilization to hatching, it's only three days. So three days post-fertilization, these uh, larvae become free swimming. Um, they're very small, so there's only about three and a half millimeters. Uh, so you can keep them uh, in, in smaller spaces, but they're already uh, showing quite a, a lot of uh, um, important behaviors. Uh, with a month, so 30 days post-fertilization, they're juveniles, and then about 90 uh, uh, days, uh, there are adults um, after. So when you look at the system itself, as I said, there's a very rapid generation time. We get uh, about 100 to 200 per week, so that means we can go through higher numbers uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, they are transparent, so that's great for uh, uh, when you want to manipulate them genetically, so all the CRISPR or other injections that you want to do, it's very easy to do. Um, the optical transparency is also there uh, in the, uh, the larvae, so we we're actually uh, can image the development uh, of the nervous system live uh, with a lot of marker lines that we have already and you can do something like optogenetics for example that is also very easy they're quite um, uh, uh, inexpensive to maintain as I said and and they have really a, a similar neuroanatomy to to humans as I said before already uh, we have uh, the fully uh, the, the sequence of the, the genome so on, we have about 70% homology to the human uh, thing. So I think what's uh, here also important, maybe uh, especially in this uh, meeting, is that um, because of the size and, and all the, um, uh, the development developmental processes that are very early on already there. They're really good for high throughput screens. Uh, they show these complex behaviors. They're permeable to small molecules that can be used in drug testing. And, and so this is something I'm going to come uh, back to it uh, in, a, in a second after. Uh, there are some limitations, so the genome is duplicated, so it's sometimes not uh, uh, very easy, uh, so you have to knock out two copies uh, if you want to do a knockout. Um, there's not many uh, inbred strains in there. Uh, obviously, non-water soluble drugs can be a little bit more tricky. Uh, there are ways to do it, but uh, there, it's, it's not as easy as usually when we can just give it to uh, the water in the tank. Um, some complex behaviors are only developed in adults, so then the high throughput uh, aspect becomes a little bit lower throughput, um, obviously, when you have to study adult uh, behavior. There's no parental care, uh, so if anyone is interested in that uh, to study, and then uh, there's still some brain regions that are a little bit difficult to map uh, to the mammalian counterpart, but overall, I think, I hope to convince you that this is uh, actually quite a, a good system. So in my lab, we have been using mostly a reverse genetics uh, um, approach. So we are starting with a mutation in a particular gene and then look for phenotypes uh, and, and the role of the gene in that particular pathway uh, in there. And so um, 
Olivia Simmons, who has just started in my lab, uh, has uh, looked into uh, a pipeline that we are quite following now. So we, we select candidate genes uh, uh, according to your data that I've heard a lot now already in uh, yesterday. Uh, in in this meeting and uh, we will generate or we are generating mutant uh, lines through uh, CRISPR uh, nowadays we have done that with zinc finger and talon before but now uh, it's a standard in terms of the CRISPR approach and then we are uh, phenotyping them uh, not only in structure and function but then also in the behavior and also uh, on some bi biochemical pathways that we can use and again because everything is or most of it is already available in the larval system we can really um, increase the number of uh, uh, animals that we can go through or number of drugs that we can test so i don't want to uh, give anyone the impression that we are obviously recreating the uh, disorder in these animals. As you all know, um, we are probably looking at individual genes that uh, are participating or uh, contributing to an endophenotype and, and therefore uh, give us some clues in terms of what this gene might do in this pathway. But uh, I think this is still a very valid approach uh, for uh, identifying some of these um, pathways. So I want to go into some of the data that we have uh, created in our lab. So we have been for a few uh, years now concentrating also on a family that is called Tenurin, so 10M or ODS. And uh, so these are large membrane proteins. Uh, they're about 300 kilodalton. Uh, we find them at the synapse, so they're, they're localized specifically at the synapse. Um, and so far, we know that they're controlling the partner matching between different cells. So the synaptic specificity uh, uh, underlying or underlying the synaptic specificity. There are four paralogs in, in vertebrates, so 10M4, uh, 10M1, 2, 3, and 4. And they can interact homophilically and heterophilically, so across the synapse. So they're really there uh, to make this physical interaction between, between them. Um, there are some association studies uh, there, so for all of them. So they're large genes, they're heavily spliced. Um, uh, and they in, in 10M1, for example, here we have intellectual disability, anosmia, 10M2, depression, uh, 10M3, epilepsy resistance gene, microphthalmia, and then 10M4, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia uh, uh, from these. So we have done uh, mutants of all of these um, and have some data on, on, on many uh, aspects of this, but I'm gonna show you uh, some data in the interest of time for one of them, which is 10M3 uh, here. So one of the systems uh, or one of the things we can do really well in the zebrafish is making uh, reporter lines, for example. So this is now imaged in one uh, field of view, the entire brain or the entire head actually of the zebrafish. You can see the eye here and here popping up on the other side and some regions that are now uh, marking all the cells that are expressing 10M4. So this is a 10M4 back, GAL4 line, and then we have a red fluorescent protein to it. Now we can go a step further and using these uh, GAL4 lines to actually inject uh, plasmids to individually label cells, mosaic, so a mosaic expression of these fluorescent proteins. And so we can actually identify the cell types, their morphology, and depending on what kind of a, a marker we are using, so it could be a, a, a calcium indicator, for example, so then we can look also at their functionality in, in that sense. So uh, that's what we did in, uh, for the uh, 10M3. So we found uh, that 10M3 is very heavily expressed in connecting cells in the retina. And so what, what you see here is uh, maybe better here in, this, in the schematic. So these are cells that are all labeled and they form these kind of synaptic bands here. And now in the mutant, so this was at that time a talent mutant, uh, what we found is that these uh, cells now are not uh, uh, connecting correctly anymore with their partners and they kind of overshoot their targets as you can maybe see here. So they're going into different laminar uh, um, uh, or laminas uh, where they, they then form connections with other cells. So structurally, we already could see that these cells are uh, misformed or misconnected. And so the next thing we wanted to see is what is the functional consequence for that. And as I said before, we're using a lot of these uh, genetically encoded calcium indicators, so GCAM3 in this case, but uh, nowadays we have uh, GCAM6, um, uh, so that are a little bit brighter and faster. And so we fuse this, or uh, this is fused now to synaptophysis, or it's like a, 
uh, a presynaptic um, uh, protein so we can actually see the responses at the presynaptic terminals and so what we did because it's a visual system uh, uh, defect that we saw first is we had the fish under the microscope um, uh, so this is a live fish or a live larvae under the microscope and we show movies on the side so we have a visual stimulation and at the same time we're imaging uh, the brain activity uh, in in the uh, retinal recipient areas and from this work what we actually could show is that if you don't have 10m3 or actually the cells that express 10m3 um, you're not able to see a particular visual uh, uh, feature in your visual world so this is has to do with orientation selectivity um, and i'm not going to go more into this but it's it's one thing that you can recognize in your visual world that has been now uh, affected while other things uh, are not affected. So a very specific uh, function for 10M3 in this case. Now you can put this a, a bit further. So this is now a, um, an image from a colleague, Misha Arens, who has done now functional imaging of the entire brain. So this is the entire volume of the brain in five micron steps and imaged at uh, 30 F, uh, frames per second. And you can see here um, that you can actually this is with the light sheet microscope so you can use the zebra fish to actually look at the all all the the entire population of neurons during a particular task or also just as a, a spontaneous uh, uh, pattern of, of brain activity. You can then use this to uh, make um, assessments of uh, connectivity in the brain so areas that are maybe connected or uh, fired together uh, and you can change that uh, into uh, a picture like this from a different paper uh, here also where you look uh, what is the activity in your mutant versus the wild type and you can see differences uh, in that all. So what, where do we go from here now for our uh, tenurins, for example? So as I said, the, the fish is really good or the larvae is a really good system for uh, these high throughput uh, methods. So this is a 96 well plate and you can see here these small uh, uh, fish in here. So these larvae in here, so they fit well uh, in there. And now obviously we can use these uh, to do, for example, uh, drug screens. So if we have our mutants and see a phenotype, uh, what kind of uh, molecules are there that would reverse that or um, uh, change that phenotype that we see? And we can analyze that uh, in molecular, cellular, or behavioral terms. Uh, behavioral assessments can be done in the larvae, so locomotion, uh, light dark, uh, for example. There is social interaction, for example, that is already seen in the larval uh, uh, zebrafish. And then we can do learning and memory tests as well uh, as that. Now, uh, how do we do this? So this is a machine that called a VAS bioimager, for example, where you have the 96 well plate here, it can be taken out. Uh, it goes into a capillary system where uh, the fish is turned to the correct orientation and then imaged with, a, uh, for example, a confocal microscope and then spit out again back into a 96 well plate so we can keep the, uh, the fish there. So this is for structural analysis um, where we can see it, or we can use a, a zebra box like that where we can do a, a high throughput behavioral screens where we can have these fish in the 96 well plate. So I hope I have uh, shown you that actually um, zebrafish lies uh, pretty much here. So it's pretty high throughput, maybe not as high as cells, but uh, it's much higher in terms of uh, physiological complexity. And so our goal is now to go with these tenurin mutants and the other mutants that we are creating right now to go through this uh, phenotype uh, uh, pathway to go on. So, and uh, that leaves me with uh, thanking the people. So I already mentioned Olivia who started this now um, and Paraday has done uh, the work on the 10M3. Angela, Lea and Juliana work also on uh, general uh, features of uh, tenurins and Andy uh, Sidlo has beautiful data on 10M4 that I wasn't able to show you today. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, uh, for this really uh, brilliant talk and some beautiful images uh, there. In <laughs> can't hear you, Ray. Did you? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, we have two questions uh, from the attendees, so um, let me just read this. Uh, the first one is: How did you prioritize the GWA significant genes to knock out and further study in zebrafish? And did you focus on any particular disorder? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, we we have done 
quite a, a strict protocol in the beginning now, uh, where we looked at uh, uh, SNPs that are really associated with uh, genes, like uh, not just laying anywhere uh, in between. So we have been looking at, at this uh, uh, very precisely with the help uh, of uh, uh, Jerome and Abigail. And, um, and so this, this is one, one of the things so that we can really identify the genes has to be within the area. And then also uh, we further looked uh, that there is uh, obviously a homologue in zebrafish. So we need to have the, the clear homologue. We prefer genes that are not duplicated for this uh, uh, initial uh, round. And um, so we go down and down and from a lot of uh, uh, gene candidates, we're filtering this into uh, just a few. Yeah. Okay, gr great. <laughs> and then we have a second question from a Palmer. Uh, Robert, fantastic talking system. Are you or anyone doing gene discovery, e.g. by GWAS in outbred zebrafish populations? I'm not aware uh, that uh, they do uh, that. Um, I know that uh, there's there's more labs, obviously, that uh, use uh, uh, GVS uh, uh, data and pick candidates like we do in, in that sense and also in a higher throughput, but uh, like like that, I'm not aware of that. 